I want to introduce you to a couple people that a lot of you know, um, Randy Alcorn and Diane Meyer, who are going to be speaking to us today. Um, again, a lot of you know Randy, been a pastor, was one of the original pastors at the church, has written a lot on the issue of pro-life and spoken all over the country, although most of you probably just know him as Dan Franklin's father-in-law. <laughs> He's been in my shadow for too long, and I decided to let him come out and speak to all of you. It wasn't that funny, Randy. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and Diane Meyer, who's joining us also, um, and is willing to come before us and, and share um, a painful story that involves abortion, but also a glorious story that shows God's grace and God's endless pursuit of us, um, that we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, and, and I'm going to ask um, a series of questions, some to Randy, some to Diane, some to both, and I'll walk us through this issue. And the first one I want to ask um, just and partly acknowledging probably what a lot of us are thinking, talking about abortion is not something that really anyone is comfortable with. Yeah. For some people, um, and no doubt for some people here, uh, there's a sense of guilt and shame that goes along with it. Diane was sharing with us on Thursday, and, and you were saying it's true of you also. Oh, there's yeah. many who just dread this weekend. Um, they do. They do, because it's painful and for some of us, we might just simply be uncomfortable. This is, this is contentious. Nobody feels good about talking about this. So the first question is, right. why is this still important for us to talk about? You know, there are some things that Jesus talked a lot about that were very uncomfortable. You know, it caused people to really question, Do you, what, what is this about? The subject of hell? He said more about hell than anyone else in all of Scripture. Sometimes we say, well, let's be more like Jesus. Let's not make people uncomfortable. Are you kidding me? He was always making <laughs> people feel uncomfortable. But he had a spirit of grace, and he proved his love, and he, he went to the cross for us. And so we need to talk about these things because they are true, because the evil one is a liar. And Jesus says he is a liar. He's a murderer from the beginning. He, when he lies, he speaks his native language. There is no truth in him, Jesus said in John 8. And he pulls off his murders by lying, by deceiving us about what's true. That deception exists not just out in the world. It exists mm. often within the body of Christ. Statistically, one out of every five women who gets an abortion professes to be a born-again Christian. And there are many professingly born-again Christian men who are getting these women pregnant. We've got to address this issue. If we don't talk about this, it's like saying, oh, well, you know, a doctor saying the patient has cancer, but, you know, if they knew that they had cancer, it would make them feel bad, so I'm just not going to mention it to them. Well, no. You identify it in order that something can be done about it. We want to help women especially and men as well who are suffering from abortions in their past and come to terms right. with it. And we want to help prevent these tragedies from happening. And the only way to do that is to bring it in front of people's eyes mm -hmm. and ask God to speak to our hearts and break through the blindness as only he can. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would agree and echo everything you said. Well, I guess if I echoed it, I wouldn't need to say it, would I? Okay. Anyway, the church should talk about this first and foremost because, well, if, every, if one in five women that has an abortion claims to be an evangelical Christian, that means generation after generation after generation of our children are being killed, and that's not right. But the thing is, is that the world tells us it's not a big deal, it, they tell us that um, these aren't even people and it's, we shouldn't worry about it. We, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And we've been listening to the world rather than to what Jesus says about this. And I think that the other reason to talk about it is because the women that, and the men that have gone through an abortion choice situation, they are spiritually crippled by it. Mm. They don't feel they can come close to God because they fear his condemnation. And the fact of it is, is that we know the truth. And we have the good news that we can share with them. And if not here, where else are we going to do that? Amen. Thanks to both of you. What I'm going to do now, and these are going to be mostly directed to Randy, although, Diane, we'd love for your input on them too. Um, I'm going to kind of present Randy with a series of statements that we'll frequently hear 
related to the issue of abortion, related to the pro-life, pro-choice debate, and I ask him to guide us through thinking about them. So the first one I'm, I'm going to talk about um, is that some will say, the Bible is silent on this issue. The Bible is silent on the issue of when life begins. So the Bible is really silent on the issue of abortion and doesn't let us know one way or the other. How would you respond to this and guide us through that? Well, I think I'd begin by saying that the Bible is very explicit on the question of taking innocent human life. It says, thou shalt not commit murder. Now, the question is, are the unborn human beings? Because the Bible does not say you shouldn't murder your cousin, you shouldn't murder the guy at the grocery store, you shouldn't murder a teenager, you shouldn't murder a toddler, and you shouldn't murder a grandmother. It doesn't make age specifications, it just says you shouldn't murder. Of course it doesn't say you shouldn't murder an unborn children. It doesn't say you shouldn't murder others specifically either. It's just you shouldn't murder a human being. You should not take the life of a human being. Now, when it says that, are the unborn included? Well, there are many passages of Scripture that make clear that they are. <coughs> Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being, God. You knit me together in my mother's womb. It was me. I was the one who was in my mother's womb. Continuity before uh, and after, while still in the womb and then after birth. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. Job talks about how God created him and wove him together in his mother's womb. Uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, chapter 1 of both books, talks about God knowing them when they were in the womb. I think a very, very powerful passage in this regard is, is Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, and this is a passage we usually don't think of in this regard, but here's, here's a great thing that happens. The angel says to Mary, don't be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. You will be with child... That, by the way, was the old terminology for pregnancy. You will be with child. What we say, a pregnant woman today used to be called a woman with child. You notice the semantic things that happen in the culture. She was with child, and now we used to talk about a woman carrying a baby, and sometimes we still do, but notice the terminology. There is product of conception, conceptus, uh, embryo, fetus. Notice the, just the depersonalization of that terminology, but we all know that there's a baby there. And scripture affirms that the same word that is used for baby here that I'm going to read in a moment, uh, it, speaking of unborn babies, is used for newborn babies, infants, two-year-olds. It's just simply a word for baby, and the same word is used mm. of the unborn. And then it says that this one who's going to be born... Uh, who's not yet conceived, because it's future tense, you will conceive, is going to uh, rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Verse 35, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month of pregnancy. So here is John the Baptist as a preborn child inside of his mother Elizabeth. So he's, he's late in his second trimester. And then Mary, we are told, goes to see Elizabeth. Remember now, the angel has said, you will conceive. So she hadn't conceived yet. Presumably... She conceived right after the angel appeared to her in Nazareth. Notice that the incarnation does, of the Son of God does not take place in Bethlehem when he's born. It takes place the moment of conception. He came into the world inside of his mother Mary. And think about that. That baby born in the barn, that baby in the womb of a peasant woman, creator of the universe, savior of the world. So it says at that time when this angel had appeared to her and she hadn't yet conceived at that moment, but at that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. 
Okay, well, we know the distance between those places and that the travel time would usually be about 10 days. In the case when someone was hurrying, it specifically says she was hurrying, it would be about eight days. Well, what that means is, since the conception had to happen at the time the angel was talking with her, presumably happened shortly afterwards, at very most, Jesus had only been conceived eight days or so earlier. Implantation starts to take place at about six days after conception and is completed about 12 days after conception. So, Jesus, present in his mother's womb, is literally not yet fully implanted into his mother's endometrial wall. That's how early we're talking about. John the Baptist, remember, second trimester, and here's what happens. When Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, the baby, John the Baptist, leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and goes on to talk about, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby, that word that's used of two-year-olds as well, that baby in my womb leapt for joy. Now, who do you think the baby is really responding to the presence of? Do you think it's really just Mary? No. He is responding, as John the Baptist always did, as the forerunner of the Messiah, to the presence of the Messiah. Jesus is present in his mother, not yet fully implanted in her womb, just conceived way before the earliest abortions mm -hmm. ever take place, and you have one unborn child responding to the presence of another unborn child, mm -hmm. the Savior of the world, and if either mother would have gotten an abortion, there wouldn't have been a John the Baptist, there wouldn't have been a Jesus to save the world later on. Now, how much more clear, and there are many other passages, does Scripture have to be, that the unborn are included in that category of human beings where we are told, thou shalt not kill them. Mm. Well, thank, thanks for that, Randy. And, and let me bring up another statement, one that we'll hear, especially um, associated with the slogan of Planned Parenthood, every child a wanted child. How do you respond to that statement? Well, I respond by saying I totally agree. I mean, every child a wanted child, absolutely. I've been in debates with... Planned Parenthood people and the Every Child a Wanted Child slogan comes up. You know, it just makes for a great bumper sticker. Every Child a Wanted Child. Well, don't we of all people believe that? Every child should be a wanted child? So what I do in those debates, or what I've done in the past, is to say, okay, I totally agree with the statement, but the question is, how do you finish the sentence? Every Child a Wanted Child, so what? Here's how I finish the sentence. Every child a wanted child, so let's learn to want children more, and let's do all we can do to get those children into the homes of people who want them. And by the way, there are millions of people waiting to adopt. There's no such thing as an unwanted child. A particular person, even their parent, may not want them, and what they usually don't want is the pregnancy. They usually don't want the inconvenience. And by the way, a lot of the moms who, when abortion is delayed, Planned Parenthood's own figures show that if somebody goes to an abortion clinic and for whatever reason they don't make their appointment, it was a rainy day, they overslept, the longer they keep their child after that, the greater the chances they'll never get an abortion simply because at one, some point they start feeling the movement of the child. So the child that is unwanted later it becomes wanted. And by the way, some born children are very unwanted when they wake you up in the middle of the night. And if unwantedness is a justification for taking the life of a preborn child at that stage of development, why shouldn't unwantedness later on be a justification for taking the life of that child? And many women have been unwanted by their husbands. But somebody not wanting you has nothing to do with your value as a person. Yeah. And so every child a wanted child, I finish by saying, get them into the homes of people that want them and learn to want them more. How does Planned Parenthood finish it? Well, they don't say this directly, but in essence, they finish it this way. Every child a wanted child. So let's just take children who are unwanted and kill them. 
before they're born. So here's what every child, a wanted child, really means in the world of pro-choice logic. It means every unwanted child, a dead child. Doesn't make for a good bumper sticker, but that is what it means. Well, well, Randy, why don't you also walk us through, um, often abortion will be talked about as an equal rights issue and specifically as a women's rights issue. Hmm. Well, one of the things that uh, is not very well known, and I've gone back and done the research on this, and I talk about it in uh, my book, Why Pro-Life, this book that's uh, available at, uh, at no charge to you, is it's the fact that historically Susan B. Anthony, pioneer in the women's rights movement, and those around her were outspoken in their opposition to abortion. They called abortion a terrible crime, and they said it was part of many men's exploitation of women because men were going to solve this problem that they had created by getting a woman pregnant, and they didn't want to take responsibility for the child, so they would encourage her to get an abortion. That's what the women's rights movement originally said. But then it was really hijacked later on through the eugenics movement, Margaret Sanger, and there's a whole history to that. And again, I, I document that in Why Pro-Life. And it's just something that we need to uh, pay attention to and recognize that, you know what? With sex selection abortions, more females are being killed each year by far through selected abortions because the vast majority of time... When an amniocentesis is took for, taken for an early determination of the gender of the child, and this happens in third world countries all the time, when the parents find out the child is a boy, they almost never get an abortion. But when they figure out the child is a girl, the vast majority of the time they get an abortion. Where does this prejudice against women come from? I remember being there when my, my first daughter, Karina, now married to Dan, was born. And she comes into the world, and the doctor looked at me and says, Sorry, Dad, it's a girl. And I said, What do you mean, sorry? I prayed for a girl. What is wrong with us? Do you know that there are villages in India and in China with the one-child policy? They determine the gender of the child through these tests. And... The vast majority of little children growing up in these villages now are boys. All the girls are killed because they're not going to have the economic prowess or be able to do this or do that or whatever it is. Something's wrong with us. And so no woman is safe until all women are safe. If unborn women aren't safe, then born women aren't safe. They can be beaten around by their husbands. You know, I want to take the time to just uh, look at a few uh, slides that will remind us of this. Do you see the baby sucking the thumb? Sucking the thumb in, in the womb. And the continuity, the child outside the womb is the same as the child inside the womb, just a later stage of development. I mean, a toddler is not better than a preborn child anymore then a teenager is better than a toddler or an adult is better than a teenager. It's not a matter of age or size. Otherwise, uh, players in the NFL would be more human than jockeys. I mean, the, the logic is just convoluted. It just doesn't work that way. The older and bigger aren't better than the younger and smaller. Again, no, no pictures of aborted babies here. These, this is actual photography. The one is... 3D, sometimes called 4D ultrasound, you know, and the other uh, is, uh, is in vitro photography where they are able to take these teeny, teeny little cameras and get inside and see the development of the child. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's just remarkable, just like the born child and the connection we should feel. That child is no more valuable now than that child was before he or she was born. Just because we parents or grandparents didn't see them yet or know them yet or even have a name for them yet 
doesn't make them any more or less valuable in the sight of God. Babies inside the womb created in God's image. These delightful babies that we see smiling outside the womb, well, they smile inside the womb as well. It's remarkable, the uh, development scientifically. People of every tribe and nation and language that Jesus died for and United States of America tax dollars paying to abort children like this family's children all over the world. You see the baby on the right? Does that kind of look like a smile on the face? Won't be born for some time, but already smiling. This, uh, I'll never forget seeing this sign for the first time in a restaurant in this great state of Oregon, which was the second or third state in the country to legalize abortion. Roe v. Wade was 1973. Abortion was legalized in Oregon in 1969, four years earlier. And yet, in the state of Oregon, every place that serves alcohol now must have this sign posted. Take a good look at that sign. Pregnancy and alcohol do not mix can cause birth defects. We'll see the woman. Well, if you're close enough to see it, you see that it, and, and look at this when you're, you're in a restaurant, look at this baby inside the mom. Now, it's harmful to the baby for the mom to drink alcohol. How harmful do you think it is for an abortion? The same woman who is pregnant driving to an abortion clinic to have her child legally killed by a doctor or her parents or her boyfriend are driving her to the clinic. If a drunk driver runs into that car and the baby dies, the adults live, but the baby dies, there's a miscarriage. The driver can be prosecuted for manslaughter. Why? because of fetal homicide laws. Yet, if he doesn't run into her and kill her, or him, the unborn baby, and the appointment is kept at the abortion clinic, the doctor legally kills the same child. Not only is he not prosecuted for manslaughter, he's, played, he's paid well for what he's done. That's the inconsistency with which we approach this issue. I want to really emphasize this picture. Again, not an aborted baby. This is on the back of my uh, book, uh, this picture, Why Pro-Life. And we got permission uh, 10 years ago when this wa picture was in Life magazine. Some of you may remember it. But this baby uh, was, had, a, uh, had spina bifida and was operated on before the baby was born. They went inside, opened the mother's uterus, took the baby out. Sarah Marie Schweitzer was the baby's name. They performed this intricate surgery, and this is now often done. And after they close the baby up, and they've given the baby anesthesia. There's a reason for that, by the way, that the baby's given anesthesia. I'll let you figure that out. And then put the baby back in, and just before they closed up mom, Sarah Marie Schweitzer reaches up and grabs the finger of the surgeon and the Photographer who took the picture, stunned, said he went in a heartbeat from being pro-choice to being pro-life when he saw this baby interacting in the world. Now, the baby's put back in the womb, and it would have been perfectly legal to kill that baby for the next couple of months until she was born. Well, I was thinking about this as I was putting the slides together earlier this week, and I thought, Sarah Marie Schweitzer, we got her parents' permission to put her picture on the back of the book. I wonder if I can find out anything about her today. And sure enough, I found Sarah Marie Schweitzer today. There she is. Now, do you understand that that same baby inside the womb, that it still would have been perfectly legal to kill once she was placed back in her mother's womb? Until the day she was born, she could have been killed. But that's her. That's Sarah Marie Schweitzer. And I... I wept when I saw these pictures because I thought, that's our little girl, Sarah Marie Schweitzer. And doesn't that, is there any question as to whether that baby, before that baby was born, was a human being? And was this human being? There is no question. If you're doubting it, I encourage you to consider what's the voice that's telling you 
that they're not the same. It's the voice of the evil one. It's not the voice of God. Wow. Um, I, I want to make one comment to all of us just before I ask Randy one more question. Um, and, and that's, as we talk about this, often we do talk about it as a women's issue and it's, it's talked about kind of in the public forum as a women's issue. And I want to make sure that we acknowledge that this is an issue that the fathers are deeply impacted by as well. I was speaking to a man in our body earlier this week um, who is decades past um, an abortion that he participated in and is still grieving over it and is still in pain over it. And he's found forgiveness and grace, but it still is painful for him. And I want to tell you about a couple things that he said to me that I know he wants to be shared here. The first thing was that he said, in our culture, men are not supposed to be bothered by this. And so when we are, we think that we're strange and we don't say anything and we don't speak up. And he wanted me to say, and I want to say, if you are a man who has an abortion in your past and you're struggling with the guilt and the difficulty of that, mm. you're not alone. Yes. Please come out and, and seek out help and community about that. And the second thing that this man I know wants me to pass along is he said, the young men need to know. They need to know what this will do to them if they have an abortion. That's what I want to say in particular to the young men here. Know that there is grace and forgiveness, but know that this will haunt you. Because when we take a life, that's something that God has made, us so, has made so foreign to us that we'll grieve it, we'll regret it. It will be something that will bring great grief and difficulty. So please, this is a woman's issue, this is a man's issue, this is a child's issue. And let's all come towards the light on this. Yes. And just one, one last question I want to ask you, Randy, before we move on to Diane, is um, it, a statement that we might sometimes hear where somebody might say, I'm personally opposed to abortion, and I personally would never have an abortion, but I'm pro-choice. Right, that's one of the most common positions I've heard people in this church, honestly, in conversation, say the same thing. You'll hear it a lot from politicians. A lot of people think that this is kind of an in-between measure. I, I kind of want to show that, yeah, I don't feel really good about abortion, but, you know, I, I'm pro-choice about it because, after all, it's a, it's a woman's own body and she has the right to do with it whatever she wishes. A couple of questions I would ask is, one, are, are you pro-choice about rape? Oh, I, I personally would not rape a woman, you understand, but I, I'm pro-choice. About rape. Well, now, I personally would not abuse a child. Okay. But, hey, you know what? If uh, somebody wants to take their hand, which is part of their body, and slap uh, a child around, uh, who am I uh, to question that? After all, it's their body and they can do what they want to with it. Well, wouldn't we realize that to be pro-choice about child abuse would be to favor child abuse? To be pro-choice about wife battering would be to essentially favor wife battering because you're not going to do anything to oppose it and you don't think laws should oppose it. I mean, I, I've said to groups before, well, I just want to make perfectly clear that I'm, uh, I'm pro-choice and, uh, and I get applause early on. That's my strategy. I say things like, I think you have a right to do whatever you want to do with your body and it's nobody else's business and certainly not these religious fanatics who are trying to tell you what to do. So always in a secular environment, I always get applause on that one. And then after that, and that's why I defend a man's right to rape a woman if that's what he chooses to do. After all, it's his body and I am not going to be a religious fanatic that steps in and says he doesn't have a right to do whatever he wants to with his own body. Well, what's wrong with that logic? We're forgetting the person that he's hurting. The innocent woman. The issue is this. If we're talking about whether you, you prefer Mexican food or Chinese food or where you want to live or clothes you want to wear, that's just a preferential issue. Of course we're pro-choice about all of those kinds of things. But we are not pro-choice when it comes to taking the life of another human being. That's not a legitimate choice and we should have laws against it. And, the, and, and that's then... What I say to people who say, well, I'm pro-choice, but, you know, personally I wouldn't have an abortion. One of the things I ask is, why wouldn't you personally have an abortion? I asked that question of a radio talk show host, uh, a feminist in Los Angeles, and we were on the phone together, and she was saying, well, I don't want to be called pro-abortion. I'm pro-choice. 
I said, well, why don't you want to be called pro-abortion? What's wrong with abortion? And she says, well, you know, it's an extremely difficult decision for a woman to make. And I said, really? Well, what makes it difficult? Because getting a tonsillectomy or appendectomy or something like that, I mean, that's, that's not that difficult of a thing. I mean, what, what is it? And she's, you know, getting frustrated with me. And then, and, and then she says, well, because, you know, she's going to kill her baby. And she said the word, baby. And it came out, and she immediately backtracked and rephrased and went another direction. But at that moment, she recognized the reason for which, the only good reason to be personally opposed to abortion in the first place, that this is a human being, this is a baby. And the very reason why we should be opposed to abortion personally because it's a human being, is exactly why we should be opposed to anyone else taking the life of that human being.